Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carlos Sunti from the University of Alicante. I'm going to chair this session. Uh, let me introduce you. First of all, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Nicolas Agrait. Uh, she's coming from, she, he's professor at the University Autonomous of Madrid and also uh, at the India Nanoscience. And he's expert, uh, he's a physicist and expert in uh, uh, atomic and molecular electronics. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Carlos, for the presentation. Uh, yeah, and I thank also the organizers for the opportunity to, to be here. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about uh, electrical and thermal transport in molecular junctions. So this is well related in part to what uh, Harry was explaining uh, in the morning. I will enter into more detail and try to, to make it uh, quite uh, a tutorial so that you can really see uh, where things come from. Okay, uh, so basically what we want to do is to, to understand how the electrons pass through one molecule from, to, from a single molecule. That means that you have two electrodes and you connect them to some voltage and then you will get a current. Okay, so the point is to understand how that current goes through the molecule and how that is related to the molecular properties. But not only the, uh, the, the electron current, but also the heat current. I mean, if you have, for example, in this case, if you have a, a difference in temperature between uh, the two electrodes, then there will also be a, a heat current. And we want to understand how that goes, say, in the case of one molecule. Uh, well, we have a bit more complications because um, uh, electric and thermal effects are, are really coupled. So if you have, a, a, say, a hot electrode and a cold electrode and you connect them through a wire, you might get some current. This is what is called Seebeck effect or the uh, uh, thermoelectric effect. And that is also very interesting because, well, it could be useful in some cases. Uh, we saw how the... Uh, the um, the uh, space rovers uh, use uh, thermoelectric generators to, to be powered, but also um, it gives information about uh, the electronic structure of the molecule. You, can, you also get the reverse effect. For example, in this case, if you apply a current through the molecule, you will also generate a temperature difference in the, uh, between the sides of the molecule. This is called the Peltier effect, and that can be used in principle to, to cool or to, or to heat uh, at the atomic scale or the molecular scale. Okay, so the, the main thing to take into account, I mean, to start is that, okay, this is not uh, related to Ohm's law. I mean, if you think about the current passing through a wire, first thing that you learn is that that is related to, say, the resistivity, and then you get the resistance of the wire and, and all that, but this, is, this has nothing to do with the problem that we have in hand here, because this is for macroscopic situations. Uh, in this case, I mean, what is behind this Ohm's law is that, okay, the electrons are moving uh, and colliding with the impurities, the effects, phonons, and a lot of things in the wire, and then they have uh, some kind of brief velocity, but this is not the situation that we are dealing with uh, when you, we have just a molecule. In this case, this, um, this mean free path, so the, the the length that the electron runs say, between two collisions is much longer than the size of the molecule. So this has nothing to do with this situation. Uh, for example, to show that this is completely wrong, say in the case of that you consider, let's say just one atom between the two electrodes. Uh, for example, if you use Ohm's law to calculate, uh, the, say the resistance of that atom, you will get that it should be like 10 ohms, something like that. Uh, in this case, you could use, or you would use a resistivity of gold, but that is totally wrong. If you do the measurement, what you see is that it's 1,000 times larger. So it has clearly nothing to do with that. And the same happens if you have, a, say, a structure like this, a, uh, an atomic chain of gold, then you can see that that conductance remains constant. So it's, it's, it's something in terms of uh, a microscopic, uh, the microscopic concept of uh, resistivity is, is something weird. Okay, so the, the point is to understand, uh, we will see what you have to take into account to understand the basics of, of this situation. And this is, um, this is explained in terms of the scattering approach. 
Basically, what you consider is that when you apply a, a voltage difference, say between the, the two electrodes, you are in some way shooting electrons from the, uh, the, uh, the high voltage side, well, the, the one that is more negative, say, to the other side, and then uh, the electron will try to get to these free states here, but it will suffer some scattering, some elastic scattering, say, without losing energy in general, in this region, and that, that is what will um, uh, give, uh, say, a certain probability, and that will give uh, a current um, when you connect um, the two sides together. Okay, so this, that, that's why that's called the, the scattering effect. So basically, you can have many of these channels, so you have to use quantum mechanics to calculate these transmissions, and you can have a situation where you have these electron waves that can be weird shaped, if you want, depending on how big your electrode is, and then these waves, for example, the black one will be scattered in this region, and then some part can be transmitted that will be depending on, on this factor, the transmission here, some part will be reflected, and that is what you need to take into account. So the conductance in this case, uh, which is the inverse of the resistance, has to do with the transmission of all these uh, quantum channels, okay? So basically, to, to solve this problem theoretically, you, what you need is to, to solve the Schrodinger equation and calculate these transmission probabilities, okay? Uh, if you consider heat, you have a similar story. You can also use the, uh, this uh, scattering approach. And you can see that, say, the current and the, uh, and the heat current, so the, the electron current and the heat current are related. They are linearly dependent on the uh, voltage difference or uh, chemical potential differences here and the thermal uh, difference. So you can write them in a similar way. So, um, we saw before the, uh, the formula, say, for the current that looks like this. In the case of the heat current, is similar. You have to multiply here by the energy. And then you can compute all these uh, cross effects, the Seebeck effect, the Peltier effect, in terms of these uh, similar integrals to this one. Okay, so in principle, we will not enter in, into the details, but basically uh, the uh, heat is also considered in terms of this scattering approach. Okay. Okay, so um, basically uh, now here, say we represent the molecule and then in terms of this uh, conductance, what is important for the uh, about the molecule is the transmission of the molecule that is related, say to the, uh, well, to the homo lumo orbital, so to the electronic orbital, so the molecule that condition this transmission. For example, in this case, if you apply this voltage difference, then the electrons will have a low probability, almost zero in this region, but it will be a high probability here. So this, was, this is what will condition the, uh, the current, okay? Uh, in the case of the, uh, say, the thermal power, when you just apply a temperature difference, then what you have is a, a different Fermi distribution on one side and on the other. And for example, in this case, these electrons here have a higher probability to pass to this side than these electrons that should like to go to this region. So the uh, transport is asymmetric, okay? So that means that uh, uh, an excess of electrons will go to, to this side, okay? So this gives uh, two possibilities. You can have the cold side could be negatively charged in this example or in this one, depending on how the molecular levels of the molecule are placed with respect to the Fermi level of the electrode, you would get the opposite situation, and the hot side will be negatively charged. This will be a positive Seebeck coefficient. Of course, uh, if you consider the Seebeck coefficient in uh, macroscopic material, uh, the definition is different. I mean, the reason for having positive or negative will be different. So uh, in principle, we don't know uh, what the sign of the CV coefficient will be for a material. It has nothing to do with the macroscopic one, okay? Okay, so how can we do these experiments? Well, basically, uh, what I will show here is uh, that we use uh, an SCM to, to measure the conductance of a molecule. In principle, this is a very nice tool because you can image, for example, in this case, we have a, a surface. This is in ambient conditions, but here you can see fullerenes deposited on the surface. Here you have uh, an atomically flat area with single fullerenes here and there. 
a cluster here, so more fullerenes at the edge of these atomic steps. Here you can see even some of the structure of the fullerene. And then you can, well, go to the fullerene that you want to test and then just go down and, and touch it and measure the current. Okay, so in principle, uh, the idea is, is quite simple. Okay, uh, so this is, um, well, we like this technique, but it's not the only possibility. There's another technique that is called the break junction technique, but using STM. So this is related to what Harry was explaining uh, in the morning. So in this case, you don't image the sample, you deposit the molecules in the sample, then you go and make a contact, and then you break this contact. And then while you are breaking this contact, sometimes you get a molecule bridging the two electrodes, and then you measure in this moment. But we will see in more detail how uh, we do that. Okay. Uh, okay, this is what Harry was showing, basically. You can do similar experiments, but in this case, in the case of the STM, we have, um, well, we can go many places. In the case of uh, a fixed uh, break junction, then, okay, well, you have what you have in this area. We can, if you have an STM, you can search for things. Well, if you want to measure the, uh, the thermal power, then you need uh, some heat source. So basically, well, you can see here, this is the tip of an STM. Uh, so we added a heater to the STM so that you can put a, a temperature difference to the, to the tip, to the top electrode, and then the surface uh, remains cold. Well, we have some thermocouple to know the temperature here and well, some extra things, okay? And with this, we can do uh, measurements in ambient conditions. So we are talking always uh, mostly of ambient conditions, not always, uh, and room temperature, okay, in these measurements. Okay, uh, Henry also talked in the morning about this uh, thermoelectric efficiency. Um, okay, just to, to, to remind you, uh, this is to give you the order of magnitude for the, uh, for the CIVET coefficient, I mean, to, to have this uh, a thermoelectric material that can be used for something, something useful, Say in real life, you need to have uh, a CBEC coefficient larger than 150 microvolts per Kelvin. Okay, it's just to keep this uh, number in mind when, when I show examples with molecules that will give us an idea if a molecule could be useful or not. Okay, they are commercial, uh, normally semiconducting materials that are used as thermoelectric materials in different applications, and they typically have like 250 microvolts per Kelvin. Okay, so it's like the higher. This is due to the uh, to the fact that this um, this number uh, tells you about the efficiency because one problem for these uh, thermoelectric materials is that okay you have to you need to have a relatively good uh, electronic conductance and bad uh, thermal conductance for it to be efficient. Okay, and that is reflected in this uh, sorry in this uh, ZT uh, number that. Is related to the to the conductances. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, well, here we have some examples of what we can do. Well, we are scanning the surface. So basically, I will show you first, without considering temperature differences, what you see or what we see uh, when we are measuring. Basically, well, we can take images. In this case, that you can guess there are fullerenes here. They are not very clear, okay? This seems to be an isolated one here, but then sometimes the resolution becomes much better, like here. You can see this is the same scale for these two images, and somehow this is much more clear. What has happened? Well, the thing is that in this case, uh, we were scanning with a gold tip, which in fact is not so sharp as in the drawing, it's, it's much blunter, so you have bad resolution, but if you are able to pick up a C60, that happens, well, say by chance, you try to pick it, and then at some point you pick it, you can see, uh, uh, you can get a much higher resolution. So in this case, we have a C60 tip to scan the C60s, and we really see them, okay, a, a bit larger than what they are in dimensions, but much with a much better resolution than in this case, and you can really uh, resolve them, okay? Uh, okay, I said that what we want to do is to touch the C60 and measure the conductance. So this is our, our test molecule in this case. So what we do is, uh, here is the conductance. So that is the current divided by the voltage. We keep the, the voltage fixed. And then we approach 
the uh, in this case is the clean goal. We approach the goal, and so uh, well we get an exponential dependence that in this scale is a, a log scale. It looks like a straight line, and then contact is established here. So this is the conductance of a one goal atom. So here is where you contact goal. Okay. Uh, you see that the, the line is not completely straight. If you do this in, in ultra clean conditions, say low temperatures or ultra high vacuum with a previous cleaning, then you will not see this tiny step. So there is something going on here, but we'll see more about that later. Okay, uh, so this is the situation for clean goal or almost clean goal. Uh, so basically we have nothing in between the tip and the substrate. Uh, and when you have a C60, so when you do this on top of a C60, so say first you take the image and then you are careful to land on top of it. So what you see is this. So this is a feature indicating that you are touching a C60. You can see that it looks quite different from the clean gold trace. So in the blue one, we make the contact here and then we retract. So we have this feature that indicates these areas where you're pressing the C60. So this is the conductance of the C60 that changes as you change, say, the pressure on it, okay? Uh, well, we have another situation. We saw, we saw before that you could pick up a C60 with the tip, but then you can, with that C60, you can go and touch another C60. So you will have one C60 on top of another. And then in this case, this is signaled by this bump here. So this is the situation where you have the two C60s. This is the conductance for two C60s. And then at some point, if you keep on pressing, then you get to the situation for one C60. So you will have a, a similar um, situation right here. So one of the C60 will roll to the side and you will have just one, okay? Uh, so when you retract, that is the red trace here. Well, you have just have one. So you break the contact with one, okay? So if you repeat this experiment many times, you can make a, a histogram. So if you plot uh, this area here, you get this uh, blue histogram, which is the conductance for one C60, which is 10 times less than the conductance of a gold atom. So for uh, so this 10 to the minus one G naught, G naught is the conductance of a, of a gold atom, which is the quantum of conductance. Uh, in the case of two C60, okay, well, it's uh, 10 to the minus three. So it's 100 times less than when you have one. Um, because in this case, in this for say for these quantum conductances or, or quantum resistances, the normal rules that you learn for resistance are not used. So you don't add to resistances, they mostly uh, multiply. Okay. Okay, so if you want to measure now the, uh, the thermal power, so what you have to do is, well, you can do it several ways, but the way we started doing it is just to, you make a, a ramp for the voltage. So in this case, it's a, a small ramp. You can see that typically you would expect that you have a zero crossing. This happens when you have zero temperature difference, but as soon as you apply a temperature difference, you see that the zero uh, moves to one side. It could be either to the right or to the left. And this is a measure of the thermal voltage uh, that is related to the Seebeck coefficient. So it depends on the temperature. So what you really want to measure is this point here. This, uh, we do these ramps as we approach the surface. So this is the, the voltage that commands the tip to approach the voltage. And then we shoot this, these ramps. And this, well, this is the electrical circuit equivalent, say for the, uh, uh, for the thermoelectric situation. Okay, one interesting thing is that, okay, this is in this plot, we have the, this trace, the blue trace is uh, what we see in the current. So it's similar to the other traces that we were seeing. It's a bit more expanded. Here we are moving, well, just uh, four Armstrongs approaching the sample. Here we, we touch the C60, you can see it here. And then you can see that this is the, the Seebeck coefficient measured at the same time. So it's a thermoelectric effect. And uh, when you touch, then you see this jump in the, uh, in the Seebeck coefficient to a more negative values say to value, say, around minus 20 uh, microvolts per Kelvin. Uh, similar situation you get for the 2C60. In this case, you go to, well, larger values, maybe minus 50 or something like that, okay? Uh, well, and then you can make a, a histogram, say, with values. You can see for every trace, you get a slightly different situation, but you can see that in general, you have this 
values have a mean value of minus 20. So this is not noise in the measurement. So the measurement is really, the noise is just these wiggles here. It's just that the, uh, say at the atomic scale, things are changing and the transmission is changing just a bit. And this produces these jumps in the, in the uh, conductance and in the uh, thermoelectric property. So it's a natural thing because the, uh, the uh, transmission is very sensitive in the details of your junction, okay, on the structure of the junction. Okay, so we get a, a wider spread here when we have the, the 2C60, because we have more possible configurations. So what we saw is that uh, if you look at the numbers, so this is almost double than in the case of uh, 1C60. Well, this is natural because in principle, if you have 2C60, say the uh, conductance, you could guess that should be the square of the transmission of one, which is always less than one, so it would be much lower. But the, uh, the uh, say the Seebeck coefficient, the thermal power will add, so you would expect to have something like double. So when you have larger molecules, typically you have a larger thermal power. Um, okay, uh, we have also explored some other molecules. In this case, okay, uh, I will tell you the truth. We were trying to increase the Seebeck coefficient. So we wanted to put things that will give uh, more structure to the, uh, to the transmission. Because if you remember the formula here, uh, sorry for going back uh, here. So the Seebeck coefficient depends on the uh, derivative of the logarithmic derivative of the uh, transmission. So if you have sharp features, so you have peaks that are sharp in the, in the transmission, then you would expect to have uh, a larger Seebeck coefficient, okay? Uh, so say, okay, maybe we introduce some resonances by this moiety in the, in the fullerene cage. So we have this endohedral fullerene with three scandium atoms and a nitrogen. And well, in principle, they look, say, from the point of view of the conductance and scanning and, and imaging, we see the same thing as, as for the fullerenes. But uh, when we measure the, uh, the Seebeck coefficient, when we measure the thermoelectric properties, one thing that we find is that, well, sometimes it is negative and sometimes it is positive, okay? And this never happened for C60. So at first we thought that there was something wrong with the, with the setup. Uh, then what we realized also is that, okay, if we do spectroscopy before touching the C60, also the, uh, the, the IV curve, so the, the current versus voltage is asymmetric. And so it, it depends, it can be like this or it can be the opposite. So it can be say the positive side could be increasing uh, higher the, uh, the current or it could be the negative side. It depends on the molecule. So it's not that it's not random. So for a given C60 it would be like this, for another it would be like this. Okay, so that means, well, endohedral in this case, is a, in fact, it's a C80. Okay, so in principle, uh, well, if you look at the formula and, and all that, this will mean that uh, your LUMO is in a different position. So it depends on the position of the LUMO. In this case, it should be closer to this side and the other one is closer to the other one when you are closer to the, to the HOMO or to the LUMO. So in this case, you are closer to the LUMO because uh, you are increasing the, the voltage. That depends on how you define this voltage difference. And in this case, this indicates that your Fermi level is, or the, uh, the molecule is aligned with the homo closer to the Fermi level of the electrodes. Okay, so it's just a, a matter of the alignment of the molecule. Okay, so you do a histogram as we did before. So for the conductance, you get slightly lower values than for the C60, for the endohedral. But for the uh, thermal power, you get just something very symmetric it can be positive or negative. Okay. Uh, what we also saw is that okay, we we tried to we were trying to understand this this situation. So what we saw is that okay, if now we pay more attention, we are touching just one C60. We can do a small ramp. I mean, press it and then release this pressure. So in the conductance will increase when you press it and decrease, and then you do several cycles. Okay. And so, uh, for example, if you look at the, uh, say at the red trace, this was uh, for one C60, 
Then what we see is that when we press the C60, the seabed coefficient decreases. When we release the pressure, it goes back to the former higher value. Then you press it and then it decreases. But for another uh, C60, for example, the green one, it starts at a negative value, but then when you press it, it goes even lower. And then when you release it, it goes high and then low. Okay, so it does the same motion, but it has an, an offset for the, uh, um, for the Seebeck coefficient. Well, okay, we found an, ex, uh, say, with the help with the, some theory, the FT calculation from the Colin Lambert group in, in Lancaster. Well, we can explain that in terms of the position of the Fermi level, say, with respect to the HOMO, uh, to the HOMO and to the LUMO uh, orbitals of the C60 that will give you uh, say different transmission with either negative or positive um, slope for the CBEC and then the variations due to the change in, in the coupling uh, to the molecule. Okay, if you do the same kind of experiment for a C60, okay, you get for the uh, conductance, you get a similar variation, but for this, um, for the CBEC, well, uh, okay, there is a change you have the same in the same direction, but it is always negative. Okay. So C60 is not sensitive to these changes. So, in that sense, uh, this uh, endohedral molecule is bi thermoelectric in some way because it can be either positive or negative depending on how it is uh, uh, on the details of the, of the molecule. Okay. How it is oriented. It has to do with the orientation of the inner part of the molecule. So uh, using the, uh, the STM break junction method, they, I explained before that you pick up a molecule at some point. So basically uh, we, here we are in contact with gold. Say this is the conductance for a one atom contact. Then you pull, you break the contact. And when you are in this situation, then the current that has gone down fast, say exponentially or even faster in some cases, then you get a plateau, well, more or less a plateau in the conductance in the log scale. This, signals that we have trapped a molecule. So this is the conductance of the molecule. In this case, we have different like, molecules of different lengths with uh, different conductances. So that's why these traces are, are different. These molecules are these oligoines that are chains of carbon, 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 uh, alternating uh, triple and single bonds. And uh, so depending on the length of the molecule, we get uh, this plateau has a, a different length because it allows you know, a larger separation between the electrodes uh, for the molecule to stay connected. Uh, you can do a 2D histogram, so you accumulate uh, the traces here, and you can see that um, they do something that is uh, repeatable. I mean, they are not exactly the same. We have the black one is an example, and the other is a 2D histogram with all the points of uh, thousands of traces, okay? And from these values, we can do a, um, a histogram for the conductance, which is not absolutely sharp. You can see that it has some width, but that is natural because the conductance, I mean, it changes when you pull. So it's not all the time the same. And there are some details. If you look at, at a given um, uh, conductance trace, you can see that there are jumps because, okay, there are reorganizations in the electrodes and that's the way it is. Okay, so uh, if you plot, say as a function of the, of the length of the molecule, we get an exponential dependence. So this is similar to tunneling in a sense. So the slope is different, it's less than that because, okay, the uh, molecule is helping the transmission between the two electrodes, but it's not really very conducting, right? It's more like a tunneling process. Uh, well, we also measure the, uh, the thermal voltage, so the, the Seebeck coefficient for these molecules. And then what we find is, a linear dependence of the uh, of the CBEC coefficient, say with length in this case, it increases well, in, in magnitude as we increase the length. In, in this case, this decrease uh, in conductance is exponential. So really uh, we are in the log scale, looks linear, but it's, it's exponential and this is linear. So the increase in the CBEC coefficient is just linear by the decrease in conductance is, is exponential. Uh, well, we have been trying for some time uh, to increase the, uh, or to find ways to increase uh, this uh, CBEC coefficient to see if molecules could be used, uh, say, could be efficient for practical applications. 
Uh, this has been a bit disappointing. I mean, for example, in this case, we tried um, chemical doping. I mean, adding groups here to this, say, long molecule, putting different groups here to see if that changes the CBEC. Okay, well, uh, there is some effect you can see here, but this is a low CBEC. I mean, we would like to have something like 150 at least, right? So this is five and it goes to nine. Okay, it's double. No? So it's a, a high increase, but still is very low. So that's a bit disappointing. Uh, we also tried, say, quantum interference, you know, but say you see meta connected molecules, conjugated molecules instead of para conjugated molecules. In this case, uh, we also got, well, this is the change in conductance that you observe, say, for similar molecules of the same family from the uh, the para that were the, the ones in the previous slide to the meta, which are these twisted ones, uh, these bent ones. Uh, so in this case, the meta has a larger CBEC, but again, you go from minus 10 to minus 14. Okay, so it's a large increase, but it's not enough to be interesting, right? Okay, it, this tells us how the structure changes, but they, from the point of view of possible application, it's not really very exciting. Another possibility is say, you say, well, maybe we have unpaired electrons. Uh, so some spin, but Nathario is not here, so no problem. Uh, maybe, you know, this will induce a resonance close to the Fermi level. Uh, so we try some uh, stable radical, these bladder uh, radicals. Uh, they have, uh, I mean, the calculations show that they do have sharp features. So this is the one that is not a radical, say the yellow one and the, uh, the red and the blue ones uh, are radicals. One is para and the other is meta and they have these sharp features. So if your, the alignment uh, with your electrode is adequate, then what you will see is that, okay, you should have a larger uh, CBEC. Um, okay, this is what is predicted by the theory. So there should be, uh, let's see what we measure. So in this case, for example, one, uh, one of them uh, has, uh, well, 26, almost 26 microvolts per Kelvin. So it's larger than the, than the yellow one that is the, the one that is not radical, that is about eight. So indeed, this radical character is helping to, to increase the, uh, the CBEC coefficient, but it still is not a, a, very, a very large value. But this is telling us that, okay, we are getting some structure, some peak closer to the uh, to the um, um, to the Fermi level of the electrodes. We also tried uh, this molecule. This is um, this was Nathario who tried this molecule. It's covalently connected to uh, to graphene. Uh, in this, well, okay, I'll, I'll skip this because I don't really understand it. I mean, this is the chemistry part. So uh, we wanted to measure this molecule, say, on top of graphene. Uh, in this case, doing it with the SDM was inconvenient. So we modified uh, an AFM. So basically uh, now we are heating the, uh, the sample and then we are with a metallized cantilever. We do the same thing as we were doing before. We touch and then we measure the, um, the thermoelectric properties. Okay, so what we find is that, well, in this case, um, we get, well, 74 uh, microvolts per Kelvin. Well, we get two in the, for this molecule, uh, you see that we have different uh, connections to the to the substrate. Uh, say for this one, we get two values. One is positive 74, which is pretty high. It's the highest we have seen for the moment. Uh, this is minus 56, which is not bad. And again, for this one, we get 70 uh, minus 27. Well, this is 70. It's not 70 plus 35. Huh? I mean, it's plus minus oh, 35. Huh? Okay. Uh, we also tried one with just one leg, and then in that case is consistently 70 something microvolts per Kelvin. So in this case, it seems to be, at least from the point of view of the thermal voltage, uh, there is some improvement. Uh, the theory is messy. In this case, it shows that, okay, this is very sensitive to, the, uh, to where you touch the molecule, really. So it's very difficult to know exactly what's going on. So the, the calculations in this case are not helping very much. So the, uh, the um, experimental results are uh, much more clear in that sense. Um, 
but this is, uh, I mean, this, these large variations are related to the sensitivity of this uh, property of the thermal, thermal power to the details of the junction, to the details of the transmission. Okay, uh, well, uh, I showed you before some uh, measurements with C60, okay, but then we said, well, maybe um, we can get higher thermal power because, uh, well, I mean, we, it was an interesting, we had interesting results. Um, basically, we designed a, a new way to measure. Uh, in this case, instead of applying a, a constant, a DC bias, we applied an oscillating bias. And then from the, say, the, um, the offset of the current, we can get the thermal current and from the amplitude, we get the conductance. So in this case, we are measuring at the same time, really at the same time, the conductance and the uh, thermal power. That allows us to, to image, I mean, to do take an image, well, two images at the same time. This is the typical uh, conductance image. In this case, we are seeing, say, the topography. We are controlling the tip position uh, to maintain the current constant. So we can see monatomic steps here. And here, this is the CBEC, I mean, the CBEC coefficient measured at the same time. And we see that is, well, about zero in the clean gold, but there are some C60s here. And in this case, we see that it is negative as it should be, say around 20 or something like that. So we can see clearly the contrast between the clean gold and the, and the C60s. Uh, well, if we do now an IZ curve measuring in this way, well, we see something similar to what we were seeing before. This is when we are contacting the C60. And well, we get in this case, um, say something like main, main, uh, minus 30 uh, microvolts per Kelvin for this molecule. So that depends on the molecule. So basically uh, the system is working in this case, uh, well, we got new samples. We wanted to have uh, specifically uh, many C60s. Well, in this case, we had too many. We have a, a whole monolayer. And this, well, happens to be homogeneously, except for some points here, uh, say around 20 minus 20 again. So not very interesting. So we say, okay, let's have something with less fullerenes, but still many. And in this case, there was something interesting. You can see here uh, blue dots and red dots, and then a, a green background. The background is the, you can see in the topography images, I mean, they correspond like this, uh, is the clean areas where there are no C60s. In this case, the uh, thermal voltage, this is the scale, is zero. The blue regions are, say, the normal regions where you have negative uh, thermal voltage, say around 20 or a bit more. But then there are some uh, red um, fullerenes. Right, because they have a positive uh, thermal voltage, which is difficult to explain unless the uh, the fullerenes are doped somehow. Okay, which uh, should be the case. You can see that there are not too many. The red ones are few, but they are in some ways surrounded. But there are some consistently. I mean, you can see that if you look in detail to these images, they are scanning the same image, and you see the same red spots all the time. So it's not just by chance. And you can see here. For example, if you go through this line, you pass on the positive um, fullerene and then the negative fullerene, and they are clearly, this is the CBEC, they are clearly positive and negative. I mean, it's, it's not noise. Okay, then if you um, try to measure on this sample, say, doing the I set that is approaching, changing the conductance, say, we get the typical, uh, say, um, log dependence here then we can see high values on so some almost reaching 100 microvolts per Kelvin uh, positive and well, some high values also negative. And okay, in, uh, in areas that are a bit messier, so with more C60s, we can see, uh, well, these are a, a lot of traces altogether, but you can see here values higher than 200 in some cases. Okay, so the, in all these traces, the blue one is making the contact and then retracting again. So at some point, there is some configuration between the C60s that gives you very high CBEC. I mean, this will be a, a good CBEC to have, I mean, 200, okay? Um, uh, in this case, uh, for example, I, you can pay attention to this one. This is higher than 200. This is almost 300, I mean, this is 300 here, positive and negative. So in this case, it was funny because when we were making the contact, it was uh, negative, going high, say to 300, minus 300. And then when breaking the contact, 
well, nothing uh, really exceptional happened in the, in the conductance, it was positive going up to almost 400, okay? And then that repeated in the, in the next, and then, well, it just disappeared. Okay, so we can see that we can really get very high. So for some of the C60, depending on the configuration that we have, we can get very high thermal voltage values. That is the highest that have been measured in molecules, also with a relatively high conductance. This could be due to local doping. We are exploring that. And uh, most likely these configurations involve several C60s, okay? Well, um, yes, I want to talk now a little about the uh, latest experiments that we are doing. In this case, uh, what we want to measure is the thermal conductance through uh, molecules. Well, first you start with a, a one atom contact, but, uh, but then we will put some molecules in between. Okay, there are, this has been done already, uh, not very long ago. There are two examples only in the literature because it's a very complicated experiment. You have to measure uh, very tiny amounts of heat. So uh, one way to do it from the IBM people in 2000, well, the end of 2016 was, you know, uh, with this complicated setup, they make some MEMS, some suspended membrane that is a calorimeter, has a heater, so they control the temperature here, and then they approach with the tip. But this is a very difficult experiment because this is very easy to break. This is very unstable. So it's not really possible to, to scan the sample. I mean, we would like to have some way to, to scan the sample at the same time. Um, you know, get more information, go different places, okay? This is done with an SCM, but in fact, they can measure only in one point and in a, in a very difficult way. Okay, they succeeded. Anyway, they succeeded in measuring these tiny amounts of heat. So here you have the electrical conductance and the, uh, and the thermal conductance measured at the same time. They have the same structure. Okay, that is what is to be expected from the theory. When you have a material that is conducting, then the, uh, we have what is called uh, wiedemann franz law, at least in microscopic uh, terms, but it turns out to, to work also um, in uh, at the atomic scale. And then the, uh, say the uh, thermal conductance is proportional to the electrical conductance with this proportion. This is T, the temperature, the absolute temperature, and this is the, this Lorentz number, okay? So for one atom contact, when you have a, say a conductance of G naught, then you, would, you should have something like 0.5 nanowatts per atom uh, for the heat conductance. Uh, well, uh, per Kelvin, sorry, that you have to divide here by, by Kelvin also. So it's uh, nanowatts per Kelvin per atom. Okay, so this is what is shown here. Um, there was also another nice experiment. They took a different approach. In this case, it's the tip that, um, that has the heaters and all this complicated structure. This is even more complicated uh, to build than the other one. And in this case, you can see the, uh, say the, conduct, the typical conductance jumps for gold. And at the same time, the thermal conductance that follows, you know, just goes together with this proportionality factor as in the other one. Okay, this is from the people from the group in, in Michigan by Pramod Reddy. Uh, and they did it for platinum and for gold, and they get similar results. I mean, basically, that Wiedemann Franz law uh, works. So, this is a, a very complicated situation. You have to do a lot of fabrication to get to this kind of tip, and it's, you cannot do much with it. So, um, oh, by the way, yeah, this same group, the, the one in Michigan, also measured for a for a single molecule. In this case, the resolution is barely enough. You cannot see anything here when they break the conductance. Uh, but then by accumulating different measurements, they can see this tiny amount. In this case, is uh, from 20 to 30 picowatts per Kelvin uh, per molecule. Okay. So in this case, it's important to take into account that it's not only the thermal conductance due to the electrons, but also the one due to the phonons. Okay, this is what happens in something that is insulating, basically. But you can see that this is, uh, before it was 500 picowatts per Kelvin. Now it's for the molecules, it's even, it's even less. Okay, so, uh, okay, um, we were trying to get this kind of measurements, uh, but we tried, we wanted to do it in a simpler way. So this one way to measure, say to do thermal measurements is you to use a hot wire 
system in this case, or, or a thermocouple system. Basically, you have a very thin wire, you circulate a current, it heats up, and then you measure the changes in resistance, okay? Or you can measure, say, the voltage, the thermal voltage that develops when you touch the sample, for example, okay? Uh, this is uh, very tiny, but it's easy to, or relatively easy to, to make, because this is a, a, a Wollaston wire, so it's wires that you can buy uh, that have, uh, say, the, the inside of the wire is uh, five micron uh, platinum or an alloy of platinum, and then it has a shell of, say, 100 microns uh, of uh, silver that you can etch away, so it's relatively easy to, to make it. Okay, so uh, there is a, well, I mean, there are some reasons not to use a hot wire to measure atomic contacts, okay, because they don't have, in principle, enough resolution. They can be too soft. If you make them long, they are soft. Uh, it's difficult to calibrate, more difficult than these platforms that the other groups were using. They can get contaminated. So it's, it's, it's really, I mean, you shouldn't do it. But anyway, we tried. Uh, so the idea here, um, so this is um, some idea that we had that we patented, in fact, is to use at the same time the uh, thermoelectric properties and the resistive properties. So, and use multi, uh, several frequencies to measure everything at the same time. So this is the tip that we will use uh, as an STM tip. So in the end, uh, we will put the sample here. Here's the sample, here's the tip. And uh, well, if we want to, basically, I mean, using different frequencies, well, the detail is here, but basically, uh, we can get at the same time the tunneling current as in a normal STM and even take images as I will show. We can measure the tip temperature because it's a thermocouple and we can measure the average temperature of the wire. That is the important magnitude to see the changes in the current flux because we are measuring the resistance. And we use different several different frequencies at the same time and you can separate them using uh, a multi-frequency uh, locking. That's what we do here, basically. Okay, uh, well, the idea behind the, uh, the hot wire is that, okay, these are the equations, say we have in the wire, we have dual heating because of the resistivity of the wire. We have thermoelectric effects, and then we have thermal conduction. So the, the thing is that the heat will accumulate in the center. Uh, well, let's skip this one. So typically you will get, say, the profile of, this is the center position will be, say, parabolic, basically. So uh, in a relatively simple way, oh, and you will get, when you put it in contact with the, with the sample, with the substrate, you will read the, the losses in, te, in, uh, in heat uh, flux will be shown as a change in resistance, basically. So uh, we can measure what is the, uh, the resolution that you would expect from that, and basically, uh, Okay, you will have, say, something like 250 uh, nanovolts per nanowatt per Kelvin to measure the conductance. So this should be, we are able to measure this, oops, this tiny uh, changes in voltage, in the voltage of the, of the hot wire, then we will be able to measure basically a one atom contact. Okay, uh, so this is the resolution. Okay, the other model I was using to calculate the resolution was not exact. The resolution would be higher because, okay, you have uh, the, the hot part has more resistivity, okay, basically. Okay, so the resolution should be, the situation should be a bit, a bit better. Uh, in fact, one interesting thing is that we don't need to model this, uh, this resolution. We can measure it directly, okay? So what is the idea? Well, when you circulate a, a, a DC current through the wire, then you have a heat is released here through something like Peltier effect. So you have a local heat in here. So you can calibrate, for example, when you have the tip, say just at any position, for example, three nanometers from the surface, you can do this calibration, but sending some DC current through the wire, and then you get this red curve. And from here, you can get the resolution of the wire. It's quite simple. You can measure it at any time. Uh, it changes with the temperature. For example, here is 7.2 uh, uh, nanovolts per nanowatt or, or volts per watt. At a higher temperature would be about nine, okay? So that's a, a great advantage because you don't need to model the system. I mean, you don't even need to know how it is because the, the magnitude that we want to measure is the 
cooling or heating here due to the sample. And that is something that you can provide just by uh, sending a, a, a continuous current, a DC current. Uh, the uh, blue curve is what happens when you send uh, an AC, a tiny AC current in addition to the normal heating current. So you get a parabola that is displaced, but center at one, the, the, when you have the DC current is displaced. So that shows you that our model is correct and that we understand uh, uh, what is going on. So just from this shift in the two parabolas, we can get the, uh, the resolution. Uh, one important thing to take into account is the, the stiffness of the probe. So it cannot be very long that will increase the resolution, but it will make it too soft and it will be impossible to scan. So with the probes that we have that are like, well, about 200 or 300 microns in length, we can scan, we can see atomic steps, no problem uh, on the gold surface. And then here is what happens when we uh, approach the tip. So uh, this is the uh, conductance that we measure at the same time that we measure the thermal conductance. And what we see is, in this case, we touch the sample at zero. Okay, the tip is hot, so we approach it, but we have the two wires, in fact, and then at zero, uh, we contact the metal. But we see that before that, say like seven nanometers before that, there is a, a sudden increase in the, in the heat flow. So we are losing heat somehow, and this happens always at this point. So there is no heat loss because, okay, we are not touching the sample, but at some point we start touching something. There is a, a jump here. You can see a tiny jump that is not noise. Uh, so there are some adsorbates on the surface. I mean, well, this is the normal situation. You try to clean the sample, but probably even this is done in, in high vacuum, but not ultra high vacuum. So the sample has probably uh, several monolayers of water that we haven't get rid of. And this is what we are seeing here. Okay, when we retract, we get, we go back to the same situation. Well, we have to retreat uh, a bit farther. Uh, in this point, we see that we break the contact say two nanometers later. And from that, we can get the conductance of this portion where we have the metallic contact. And we can see that it's larger than what you would expect, say for, for gold, say from the biedemann franz law. Because, okay, you have the addition of this conductance to the one due to the metal, right? Okay, uh, so after playing a little with the tip and trying to get rid of this water by heating more with the tip and scanning, you can see that now we get very different results. So we are approaching the contact is the electrical contact is established here. And this is where the, uh, the thermal conductance starts increasing. So we have nothing, uh, well, maybe a slight increase here. Uh, and here is when everything starts increasing. So in this case, we have succeeded in getting rid of this layer of absorbates. So the sample is clean and we can measure here the dependence, say the relation between the uh, electrical conductance and the thermal conductance. And we get a value say about uh, 0.5 nanowatts per Kelvin as it should be. Okay, this is a uh, wiedemann franz law. Uh, okay, one thing is that uh, well, we are getting, uh, I mean, it's not breaking when we have one atom. Uh, let me skip this one. Okay, so for example, when we can see that when we make the contacts, when we make the contacts uh, without having any heating, say without an AC current, we can see these conductance steps breaking at, this is a zoom. Okay, they break at say one G naught. That means we have one gold atom at this point. So this is the normal situation. So the probe is doing its work fine, but then as soon as we start heating, then we lose the steps, right? You can see that uh, the contact breaks about, well, three or four atoms. Uh, so what's, what's going on? I mean, uh, this shouldn't happen because you can see here, you, we have steps and here we don't have steps and where are the steps? Okay, well, the point is that, okay, we are passing an AC current and then if you think about it, and there is a, if there is a, some uh, magnetic field, for example, the earth magnetic field, which we do have, then passing a, an AC current could produce a vibration of your wire because it's a wire in the magnetic field. Okay, if you calculate it, you can see that say for typical values of the earth magnetic field, uh, well, we should get a force on the wire of about 
0.5 nano nanonewtons, which is not too much. But if we consider that the effective elastic constant of the of the wire, well, that was in a, in one of the previous slides, is about one uh, nanonewton per nanometer. That means that okay, this is oscillating about 0.5 nanometers. That means that okay, the tip is oscillating when we are heating with an AC current, and that's why we cannot see the steps in the current because it's it's really you know it's it's not breaking in a clean way. Okay, uh, I mean, we have proof of that because if you put a, a DC current here, then we see the steps again, we see a curve that is very similar to this one. So the problem is not that we are heating, the problem is that the tip is oscillating. So well, we, now we are working on solving that problem to avoid the, the oscillation. Okay, well, uh, I think I will end here. These are the people who have been working in the different uh, projects that I have shown. So basically with the conductance of the molecules and the uh, and measuring the thermal power. Uh, Ruben is the one who has been working lately on these thermal conductance uh, measurements, which are uh, quite demanding, as you can see, because of the tiny um, values that you have to, to measure. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have a couple of questions. Okay, I have one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I've seen that you have uh, used the um, uh, gold uh, electrodes, but also some platinum electrodes. Yeah. For uh, the thermal uh, yeah. effect, uh, does it make a difference because uh, the the, the, I guess the density of states of the both electrodes are quite different. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, what we see is that the uh, say the breaking of the one atom contact is the one corresponding to gold. So it breaks as if we had gold. So probably, I mean, since we are making many indentations, then the uh, this platinum and platinum rhodium uh, tip uh, gets covered with gold. That happens. I mean, if you use a, a platinum tip and you make gold contacts, typically it gets covered with gold, which is a softer material, and then you are really making uh, gold contacts. So from the conductance, um, what we deduce is that we are really having gold gold for the contacts. And have you tried all other electrodes? Because... Uh, it's difficult to try other electrodes because, uh, okay, you need to have the adequate thermoelectric properties. Uh, you need them to be a Wollaston wire so that you can etch the silver away. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult to to try, say, with this geometry, to try a different electrode. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Um, yeah, maybe I didn't quite understand, but why do you get a higher resolution if you have already a C60 atom on your tip? Yeah. Yeah, probably you don't understand because uh, say the drawing is uh, is misleading. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the tip, uh, so yeah, the gold tip looks more like this. I mean, it's not an anatomically sharp tip because, okay, I mean, the, it, if you scan, if you make a, typically when you break a gold contact, say you get like a little mountain about one nanometer in radius, uh, in diameter, basically. So typically this should have, say like uh, two nanometers diameter and the C60 is 0 0.7 nanometers in diameter. So it's really smaller. So this situation is, uh, more realistic in that sense that the gold tip will be typically even larger than that. Okay, so okay, thank it, you. I mean, having, in fact, drawing just a, a tip with one atom at the end is, is not very realistic. I mean, there might be one atom, but then you have something relatively wide. So that's the reason. This you can see in the shape of the atomic steps, for example. How are you planning to solve the problem of the oscillation of your tip? 
Uh, excuse me, I didn't understand the... Uh, on the last uh, slide, uh -huh. you said that there was uh, chip oscillation problems. Okay. Uh, yeah, the question here is that... Okay, due to the magnetic field of the Earth, or I mean, also the uh, the magnetic properties, say, of the materials that we have that are not completely non-magnetic, we have brass and stuff with some impurities, uh, we have some uh, some remanent fields that would be enough to to have this oscillation in the tip. So we don't want to have this oscillation. So we we really need to compensate uh, for these fields uh, to avoid the oscillation. Okay, because we want to have these kind of steps here and we don't have them because of the oscillation. Okay, so this, the oscillation is very small, you could say, but say one Amstrom, I mean, one atom of gold is half of this size. So it's, the oscillation is still too high. But how, how are you planning to solve that? Uh, well, I mean, you can compensate it with some coils or with some magnets. I mean, we are working on that. So uh, basically it's adding a field in the other direction. You can also try to cover it with say with mu metal, but okay. So it's, it's a matter of compensating the field so that you can make it zero at the point of interest. Senor. Then in, in the molecules that you have shown of Nazario having one leg, two legs, and these mm. kind of things, you see differences. But you understand why are different the, the, the different curves or not? The different. Uh... Yeah, because from the point of view of uh, the the contact, the contact is uh, one. Well, what is important there, the contact or the molecule? Well, the molecule is important because, say, you get different values for the molecules. I mean, they have slightly different behavior, but is uh, still the uh, for each each curve that you get is very important. Say the local situation, exactly where you are touching and if you are pressing, or so it's, it's really a, a bit of a messy system. No, but the, with the same molecule, you will obtain several results. If you take yeah. the one leg and you repeat several times, each time you will have one yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. Histogram. So you, we can say for if you have say one leg, for example, we don't get uh, negative values. If you have two legs, we get negative and positive values. Uh, here. No, so the have, histograms you... are different. Okay, the values are widely distributed because the details are very important. I mean, in all these measurements, the exact position uh, of the Fermi level with respect to the molecule levels are, are very important. Yeah, but in, in that case, uh, even the, the C60 without anything, you will see also some differences yeah. in a C60. Yeah, so in the case of the, for the C60, I mean... Only C60, you, each time you measure, you will obtain uh, results. Yeah, but in this be... case, I mean, for the, the ones that the results I was showing for the C60, for example, in this case, uh, yeah, I wanted, uh, I wanted you to see that, okay, every time you measure, you get a different thing, not because you have noise, because, for example, in this case, this is uh, when you are breaking the contact and then when you make the same contact, so this is right after this, this other curve, you get something similar. So that means that you have some configuration that is similar, but then if you keep on moving, then, okay, you might lose it completely. So it's very difficult to, to, to know exactly what you have, for example, in this situation where you get, when you make the contact, you get something very high negative, then you break it, it's, very high positive. When you go back, it's still very high positive and, and then nothing. So you have some special configuration, I don't know, several C60s, but may, three maybe could be enough. But it's, uh, I mean, we are trying to model that to try to understand in which situation we can get it. But possibly for this, you really need to have it doped in some way. And having in that case, more extended systems, more connected in the surface in which you have only one configuration possible, cannot be better. For example, if you put some kind of system with three legs that are attached and that cannot move at all, the molecule can will stay always in this position by these three uh, legs. Yeah, I don't know. That's difficult to tell in advance. I mean, what the feeling that we had for this and, and we were right is that disorder is good in but that sense. I mean, being able to explore different possibilities 
is good for these uh, thermoelectric measurements. With the thermoelectric measurements, when you do that, the, mo the molecule is not uh, moving? No, no, it's not it's moving. I mean, we have, well, when we are moving, uh, say, up and down, say, you, you can imagine that you have, say, one C60 here, another one here, you know, and, and the configuration, the relative position of the different C60s, but maybe it's three or four, not more than that, is changing. We don't know how, that's the, that's the problem. So we don't know how the issue change, but you know, uh, it is possible to get it. I mean, we know how to get it, but we don't know exactly uh, what the positions are. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nicolas, for the nice talk. I, I have a question. Uh, last year, Tim Albrecht published a paper in JPCC uh, explaining how to determine thermal power without all the temperature set up. What do you think about? Uh, uh, which paper was that? Uh, it's a J JPCC uh, paper where he, well, he published saying, well, you can determine directly from the traces without any oh. temperature set up in the electrodes, uh, the thermal power properties. Well, uh, well, relatively. I mean, the, the point there is that uh, we were showing, say, for the theory, in principle, you could, uh, I mean, the, the, the conductance is related. So the ID curve, so if you vary the, uh, the voltage and you measure the current, that is related to the shape of the transmission. And the thermal voltage is also related to the shape of the transmission, right? So in principle, you could say, okay, if I know the shape of the transmission, then I can guess the thermal power without measuring it. But the problem is that from the ID curve, you don't really know the shape of the transmission exactly. I mean, you have a certain different possibilities because uh, it depends also on the symmetry of the junction, say, between the molecule and the electrode. So there are several unknowns in that case. Okay, so they, you can get an idea because if you have, say, sharp ID curve, then you would get a larger, typically a larger thermal voltage, but it would be difficult to know exactly what uh, what values you would have. But we can see it in, in more detail. You know. Okay, so let's. Uh, thanks, uh, speaker again. Thank you.